broadcast of Calvary Compassion Church. You're listening to Pastor Teddy Sanders. Let's join him as he teaches verse by verse from the Word of God. Say it louder. I can't hear her. Yes, we are favored and love. Amen. All those things are true about last week. We learn, number one, what did the Bible say? That we are to what? Love whom? Our enemies. Our enemies. I know that's not a popular message, but it's one that Jesus modeled for us. You know, how to love in the face of opposition. How to love those who uh, mistreat us and misuse us. Uh, We learn that in verses 27 through 36. And in verse 37 through 42, of course, we learn not to judge unto condemnation. Make sure that you add that. Because when we get over to Corinthians, Paul says that we're not to judge those who are outside of the church to condemnation, but we are to judge those inside of the church according to the standards and the word of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we truly do thank you for this day. Lord, this is a day that you have made, and Lord, we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Father, for Today, we recognize our earthly fathers, but Lord, we want to recognize you first. Father, for your word declares that we are to seek you first in your kingdom and your righteousness and all other things shall be added unto us. Lord, you are indeed a good, good father. Lord, as a matter of fact, you are a great, great father. Lord, you have shown what it's like to love unconditionally. You have shown what it is like to, Lord, just to to be a, a good earthly father. Lord, we know that we'll never measure up to you. Lord, that's why you gave us your spirit, Father, that abides in us and shall lead us and guide us into all truths. And so, Lord, I not only pray for the dads that are here, but those who are not here, Lord God, and, Father, those who may be listening uh, via Internet. And so, Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honor, because all of the glory belongs to you. Father, we ask now that you clear our hearts and you clear our minds, Father, that we can hear clearly what it is that you would have to say to us. Lord, as James has always instructed, Lord, that we are just not to be hearers of your word only, deceiving ourselves, but, Lord, we are to be doers of your word. Father, you said that if we love you, we will obey your commandments. And so, Father, we thank you that you are here among us, that you are within us. Lord, may we just not hear another Bible study, Lord, but may we apply those things to our lives, that which we hear. For everyone with the ear, let them hear what the Spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's pick it up. Luke chapter 6, verse 43 says, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs, underline that, from thorns, nor do they gather grapes, underline that, from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. We're to judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. Now, when we worked our way through Galatians and we got to the fruit of the Spirit, and, and for those brothers who were at our demands Bible study where we went through each one of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, we know that everything is, the foundation, of course, is of love. Everything that we do, love has to be the foundation because the Bible teaches us that God is what? God is love. And so that foundation of love helps us to produce fruit. How many of you have remembered, fruit are not for us to enjoy, but the fruit is for others to enjoy. Now, I had you to underline figs and grapes because you have to understand that during this time, that was Israel's cash crop, figs and grapes. And also in the Bible, the fig tree is symbolic of the nation of Israel. You can go and write this down, Uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 8. Nahum chapter 3, Nahum chapter 3, and Hosea chapter 9, Hosea chapter 9, and there you will find how the Lord uh, uses Israel symbolically as the, the fig tree. Now, very quickly, turn over to the gospel of Mark chapter 11, 
Mark chapter 11. Put, put a place there in Luke chapter 3, but turn over to Mark chapter 11. And we're going to see here in Scripture how the Lord cursed a fig tree for not bearing fruit. The Lord cursed the fig tree for not bearing fruit. Once you there, say amen. Mark chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 12 through 14 and verses 19 through 25. Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 12. It says, the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed the fig tree in, in full leaf a little ways off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs, but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. You know, there are a lot of times in, in a lot of churches where, you know, we dress the part. You know, we, we, we look like we got it all together. You know, we, we wear the, the suits and the, the nice dresses, and, and in this case, shorts and blue jeans. And, you know, just because you're here doesn't mean that you are right with God. Doesn't mean that you are right with God. Just because you go to church will not get you saved no more than me standing in my garage will make me a car. The proof, as they say, is always in the pudding. Verse 14. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Now drop down to verse 19. That evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree, he had cursed. The disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you curse has withered and died. Now, very quickly, i got to give you just a, a little, little biology lesson here or whatever, botany or whatever it may be. Now, in Israel this time now, some would say, you know what? Man, that was kind of that was kind of cruel that that Jesus would would curse a fig tree. Remember, it was a fig tree. It looked like it should have in the times that it was supposed to bloom, but there were no fruit. There was no fruit. And remember, Jesus went to the tree so that he could partake of the fruit. Remember, fruit is always for someone else to enjoy. But now, if you if you look at Matthew's gospel in the twenty first chapter, nineteenth verse. Matthew lets us know that this was a lone fig tree. I'm going to repeat that. It was a lone fig tree. So Jesus didn't necessarily curse the fig tree because it didn't bear fruit, but it was also a lone fig tree. Now, whenever you go back and you look at the different orchards of, of figs, fig trees, fig trees need one another because of, you know, they, they, the, the self-pollination, you know, they, they are always around other fig trees because it's a part of the process. But notice that this fig tree was alone, and it looked like a fig tree, which it was. The leaves were green, but it had no fruit. And the same thing could be said about us is that the Lord has not created you and I to be alone. He says that we are to congregate together as believers. Hebrews chapter 11, or 10, 25, the Bible tells us that we're not to forsake ourselves with the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. And so we are called, right, as trees, right, to bear fruit for others to enjoy. What does this look like? Well, when you come to church on Sunday mornings, you may see that we had the prayer councils up here, right? And so some of you came because you, you, you want to be united in spirit with another brother or sister to help lift your petitions before the Lord, right? And so what happens is, is you get to come and enjoy the fruit of the prayer counselors because, you know, they spent not only this morning, but they spent time out throughout the weekend, and I'm sure they cry out to the Lord on behalf of our congregation. You know, one of the things I, I, I love about uh, Patricia, you know, uh, she's an intercessor, and, um, you know, we always talk about how, you know, whatever time of day or night it is, the Lord wakes us up or he stirs upon our spirit to, to intercede on behalf of the brothers and sisters and also those who are, who are not believers yet. But it's because of the fruit that the Lord has produced in our lives that on Sunday mornings and throughout the, the week that we get to partake of those fruits from other brothers and sisters because we're not created to be long ranger Christians, does not exist. Does not exist. We need one another. And so Jesus uh, cursed the fig tree not 
primarily because it, it gave, it had no fruit, but because it had not been with other fig trees where that, that cross-pollinization could take place, where it could bear fruit. Now, what's interesting about this is that as you continue to read Mark's account in Mark chapter 11, is that Jesus curses the, the single fig tree because it bore no fruit, but guess where he was on his way to? To cleanse the temple. And so remember, I told you when you're reading a scripture, just, just don't read a scripture and then, you know, take that scripture out of its context and, you know, you go and you make it say what you wanted to say. That's why it's important to read systematically through the Bible. That way you get a better understanding of what the scriptures are all about. Now, one of the things, you know, as a pastor, people come up to me all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. You should. And, you know, you say, well, the Lord has placed this upon my heart and, and so forth and so on. And, you know, what? I have learned over the years I can never say what the Lord has placed upon somebody else's heart. Amen? Because you don't know what the Lord has told them. But I do know that I'm to be a fruit inspector. How many of you are fruit inspectors? And when I say fruit inspectors, not to condemn, but you know what? To make sure that what I hear is also what I see. Amen? Because, we you know, people talk, some people have to get the gab, right? And they talk a good game. And I always tell you all that you have to make sure that your actions match your speech. Because people don't care what you say. They want to see that you live your faith out loud. People are always watching. And so, therefore, I'm always a fruit inspector. And how many of you would like to be fruit inspectors? Right? Somebody say amen. Y'all know I can't see. Say amen. Thank, thank you. Thank you right there. Thank you. Say amen. And so this morning, I'm going to give you all a couple of things to, to be inspectors of good fruit. Inspectors of good fruit. Now, the first thing you have to learn to do to be a good fruit inspector is shut your mouth. See, the Lord has given us one mouth and two ears. And so the first thing as a fruit inspector, you got to learn to close your mouth. Over in Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. Proverbs 17, verses 27 and 28. It says, a truly wise person uses few words. A person with understanding is even tempered. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. With their mouths shut, they seem intelligent. So, now... For those of you who have never hung out with me outside of a Sunday morning, you would, I would probably come across as stuck up. And the reason I would probably come across as stuck up is because I'm not a talker. This is the only place I do most of my talking. My wife and my mother can tell you. Matter of fact, my, my mother calls me sometime, and when she calls, she's like, Bishop, that's my nickname. Don't y'all call me that. That's, that's, that. that's between me and my mama. She say, Bishop, you talking today? And I'm like, if I have something to talk about, because I've learned that I have one mouth, two ears, and then, you know what? The Bible says that a fool seems intelligent when he keeps his mouth shut. You are more likely not to say something dumb when you don't say anything at all. So the first thing you and I have to learn to be, as fruit inspectors, you've got to learn to shut your mouth. Because here's what I know about people. People will tell you everything you want to know if you just shut your mouth and listen. Right? And that's part of being a fruit inspector. Now, the first thing that you and I should be looking for is the fruit of love. Write this down, the fruit of love. Over in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, we know this is the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control, there is no law against these things. So the first thing that you and I to look for when we're being fruit inspectors is, you know, is the individual a loving individual? Are they loving unconditionally? That word love in the Bible is the word agape, and it means to love unconditionally. Unconditionally. You give without looking for anything in return. Now, I'm going to do a sermon on that very soon. But if we're honest with ourselves, our love comes with conditions. 
well, you didn't do this, so I'm not going to do that. Or you did this, so I'm going to do that. And what happens is we get caught up into that bickering because we're not loving according to agape love. Because agape love gives without looking for anything in return. And it gives to the point of death. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That word love there is the verb form agapeo of that word agape, to love unconditionally. And so being a part of a fruit inspector, keeping your mouth shut, your ears open and listening, and then you're looking for that fruit of love. Number two, the fruit of conversion of souls. The fruit of conversion of souls. Are you sharing your faith? Right? How many of us have ever met a stranger and you know you strike up a conversation you like they got to be a believer you just know there there's something in your spirit man that 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 unites with that individual spirit and you just know that they are believers right and then you know with that you see just just sharing your faith are you sharing your faith listen you don't have to be a theologian you don't have to be a deacon elder or pastor to share your faith all Jesus asks of you and I is just tell somebody what he has done for you. There's nothing more personal than the, powerful than the personal testimony. Listen, we are all here because Jesus changed our lives. You are not here on your own agenda. And if you are, I can already tell you by being a fruit inspector that your motives are wrong. Because we're here because of the love of God. We know and we value the importance of coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship our Lord. And so the, 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 the fruit of conversion. Over in John chapter 4, verse 36. John chapter 4, verse 36. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. And then over in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, it says, The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Hey, just simply share what the Lord has done for you. You know, when you go to Walmart, look for opportunity uh, to share your faith. As Paul and Linda like to say, divine appointments. You know what? When I'm in Walmart, I tend not to smile. And the reason why I tend not to smile is because not only am I giving Walmart my money, they're going to make me check out myself. And I don't like that. And so every time I'm on my way to Walmart, you know, I'm ho-humming it. Right? But you know what? The times when I go into Walmart and ask the Lord to provide an opportunity for me to share, I'm walking around with a smile or, you know, I have on a T-shirt or, you know, just someone, hey, how you doing? And I'm, I'm blessed and highly favored. You want to know why? Or, you know, I, 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 and I give them an invite card to attend the service. You know, but we have to learn to get outside of our comfort zone. And a lot of times what happens is we're afraid of rejection. I'm guilty of it as well. But you know what? When an individual rejects you, it's not you that they're rejecting. They're rejecting the Lord. And, you know, we have to learn to, to, to get over that. We have to learn to get over that fear. And listen, if you ask the Lord to help you with that fear, he will. And like I said, you don't have to be a theologian. You know, just simply share a smile and a story. That's it. Well, you know, I don't know about that, brother, sister, but let me tell you what God did for me. And you know what? He says, I'm going to respect the person. He will do it for you as well. Number three, the fruit of works of righteousness. The fruit of works of righteousness. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. For to me, this is Paul, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful works for Christ so I really don't know which is better. I am torn between the two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sake, it is better that I continue to live. Can you honestly say that about yourself? Can anyone say that about you? It is better that you are here. And that should be the goal of all of us. My personal vision is to make everywhere I go better. Right? 
and I'm going to do that by sharing my faith. I'm going to do that by praying for people. I'm going to do those things which I saw Jesus model, our Heavenly Father, works of righteousness. Number four, the fruit of monetary giving. The fruit of monetary giving. Romans chapter 15, verse 28. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to, sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. And so what Paul is saying here, you know, because they were given to the church, he was going to pick up the, the, the monetary uh, gain, and he was going to give it to the Jerusalem church who was in need. And so one of the things here, I, I don't know who gives what. And I tell you the reason why I choose not to do that, so that I won't treat those who give better than those who are unable to give at this time. But listen, it's not about the dollar amount that you give. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. Everyone in here should be a giver. And I'm not going to harp on giving at this point. But listen, you can't outgive God. You cannot outgive God. He said, I will be in debt to no man. And it may not always come back in monetary form, but it may come back in favor. It may, co may come back in him revealing a situation until you're giving you wisdom. You cannot outgive God. Listen, and, and, and I also encourage you to diversify your giving. Not only should you give to your local body, but as the Lord lays things upon your heart, you should also give to those things. You know, my, my wife and I, for years, we gave to far-reaching ministries. Uh, we also started giving to St. Jude. And then uh, when we had uh, the young couple uh, come in from GBCM, I, we prayed, and I told my wife, you know, the Lord has put this on my heart, and, you know, we are now giving to G GBCM to support uh, the local kids in the mission. And so diversify your giving. I tell you, if you look at where your money go, all it is for us is just one meal per week that we decide not to eat out. We can take care of a child, right? And so the fruit of monetary giving. Number five, the fruit of praise, the fruit of praise. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. It says, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. None of us have an excuse not to praise God. None of us. You know, Jesus said, hey, if you won't praise me, he said, our very rocks will cry out. And I'd be doggone if I let a rock give God more praise than I'm going to give him. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know, I, I, I praise God not only here on Sunday morning, but I, I wake up and I'm thanking God for his goodness. Right? You know, very quickly, be transparent with you all. I woke up Thursday morning, and I was feeling some type of way. And I'm making up my bed, and I'm complaining that I got to make up my bed. I'm complaining about the bed that I prayed for and the Lord blessed me with that now I got to make it up. Shame on me. I did repent because complaining you shouldn't do. And what happened was I got a phone call from my wife Thursday morning stating that the, the school resource officer died, had a heart attack and died, 40 years old. I'm so sure most of you have seen the news you know, Officer Steve Brown, 40 years old, passed away. Here I am complaining that I got to make up my bed that the Lord blessed me with. We have to learn perspective because there's always something that we could praise God for and thank him for. Amen? Always. And don't let the enemy set that trap for you where you get to thinking ho-hum only about yourself and what you don't have. To where you can't offer praises to God. Because let me tell you, if you have never been on a, a missions trip, I would encourage you to see Doc, to see Paul and Linda Burton, and we'll arrange for you to go and we'll team up with another church if we have to. But what happens is when you see how the rest of the world lives, kiss the ground where you are. Just talk to them. They'll tell you how the rest of the world lives compared to the poorest of our poor. The poorest of our poor of our poor is richer than any place else around the world. And we have a lot to praise God for. We have a lot to be thankful for. If you're here this morning, you got a lot to be thankful for. 
because as you heard, you had Mr. McGrew who lost a loved one, you had Jimmy McDaniel lose a loved one, and you had Smitty lose a loved one, and those are just the ones we know of. But every day, there's a family grieving. Every day. And so, don't let the enemy rob you of offering that sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Amen? So, those, that's not an exhaustive list of what it is to be a fruit inspector, but just a few things. Like I said, if you sit back, listen, keep your mouth closed, people will tell you everything you need to know. Everything. Trust me. Back over to Luke chapter 6. Let's pick up verse 46. Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 46 now. It says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Over in Matthew's gospel, chapter 7. You don't have to turn, I just write it down. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of the Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks God's laws. What Jesus is saying here, he's saying, you know what? Because of my great name, he said, when you call on my great name, he said, I'll allow you to prophesy. I will even use you to cast out demons. I will even use you to heal the sick because that's my name. But then he goes on to say, depart from me because I never knew you. You have to make sure that you have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. That is paramount. Not looking to him for what we can get or what we can do, but just spending time at the feet of the Savior, knowing him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Trusting in him with all your heart, not leaning to your own understanding, but acknowledging him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all other things shall be added unto you. There is no substitute for spending time with the Lord, just as he did with Adam. Where are you? I'm longing for you to walk with you in the cool of the day. Listen, all the other stuff is a byproduct from spending time with the Lord. And I will encourage you every time that I have an opportunity to teach, that it is far more important that you have that relationship with the Lord, close and up and personal. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. And you have to understand how much he really loves you, how much he really wants to free you of those burdens that you are carrying around. They were never meant for you to carry around. He said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. We get to experience the blessings of the Lord in the land of the living. And listen, whatever you may be experiencing, take it to the Lord in prayer. Turn it over to the burden bearer. He wants to do that for you. He longs to do that for you. Why? Because he's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. Listen. Take it to the Lord in prayer, regardless of what it is. Some of you are carrying around guilt. Some of you are carrying around bitterness. Some of you are carrying around hate. Listen, those aren't characteristics of having a loving relationship with the Lord. The Lord can take that hate and turn it to love. He can rid you of that bitterness because, see, bitterness and guilt only hurts you. Only hurts you. And I am at a point in my life where, you know, I'm not carrying around not my own guilt, yet alone someone else's. Life is too short to be bitter. Right? Too short to be bitter. G. Morgan Campbell noted the threefold conditions in verse 47. Let's look at that very quickly. In verse 47, Luke chapter 6. Number one, whoever... Everyone that comes to me, 
is, which is total surrender. Number two, and here's my words, discipleship. Number three, and does them is obedience. See, a good fruit inspector is looking to see, are you going to be obedient to the word of God in all areas of our lives? See, what happens is we take on a smorgasbord mentality. We, we take on a golden corral mentality. Now, I love golden corral. You know, I love going over there. And you know, before I even sit at the table, I grab my plate, Brother B, and I go to the steak line, get me a little piece of steak. And then I work my way around the corner right there to the, the fried chicken section and get me a little fried chicken. And then I work my way around. I get my broccoli and I get my, uh, my sweet potato casserole. And you know what I don't want, I don't get. And what happens is we take that same approach as it relates to the Word of God. Well, well, no, I ain't really got to do that. Yes, you do. See, what happens is when you realize that you're going to be accountable to the Almighty God for things that you have done and things that you may have said, it changes your perspective on life and how you treat people. Listen, I believe every word that the Bible says and I want to be obedient to all that the Lord has commanded. My goal and your goal as Christians should be to be consistent, that we're so consistent, that we're temperate, that regardless of what goes on in our lives and around us, you know, we're, 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 we got that balance. You got that balance. But you only get that balance when you spend time with the Savior. Sure, there's going to be things that the enemy and life throws at us that shakes us in our faith. But what happens is you got to remember where due north is. You got to remember where due north. Lord, if you did it before, I know that you can do it again. And it's not always going to be the same way. But the bottom line is that it brings glory to the name of the Lord. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. We know it. I quote it all the time. But don't just listen to God's word. You might do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. Jesus says, for those who hear my word and obey it, and obey it, all facets of life. I'm not going to stand before you and tell you that I'm perfect. I am far from perfect, but I am being perfected because of the spirit of the living God. And I know that one day I shall be as he is. And I know that one day you shall be as he is. Listen, grace is not an opportunity for you just to merely apologize and keep living, living the same way. There has to be a change. True repentance, there has to be a change. No one can ever have an encounter with the true and living God and still be the same. You need to check your source. But when you realize that you are a sinner and that you've been saved by grace through faith, that it's not because of anything that you have done, but it's because of the love of God. It changes who we are. It changes how we live. It changes what we think and say. Amen? Amen. Verse 48, Luke chapter 6. It says, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the streams beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built, who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the streams beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of the house was great. Now, very quickly, the foundation, of course, is Christ. We need to have a foundation built in Jesus Christ, built in love. Husbands and wives, husbands, love your wives as Christ have loved the church. That is not optional. That is a command. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands as unto Christ. Now, what happens is we get caught up in our feelings, right? We get caught up in our feelings, and you negate the principles of God because of how you feel. And then when all hell break loose out in our homes, we wonder why. Because 
our love is conditional, if we are honest. See, you can have the worst husband or wife in the world, but when you're loving unconditionally, when you're loving the way that Jesus loved, it doesn't matter what you get in return. Oh, Pastor Butch, you don't understand how they treat me. Well, I understand what the Word of God says. I know what biblical love is. I know what godly love is. You don't understand what he said to me. I do understand what they said to Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you all to remain in an abusive relationship. I will never, ever endorse a, a divorce, ever. And the reason being is because if you and your husband reconcile, the only thing that you all are going to remember is Pastor Teddy told us to get a divorce. That's what happens. Did y'all know that, that happens to me? That's why I never tell a couple to divorce, regardless of the circumstances. I give them the Word of God. According to the Word of God, this is what the Lord says. It's always the Word of God. Always. But we get caught up in our feelings. And we don't love the way that God intended us to love. Yes, it sounds difficult, but I know through the Spirit of the living God it's possible because the Bible says that all things are possible with God. And what happens is we are double-minded in, in, in our approach to the kingdom of God. Well, if he or she doesn't do that, then I'm out of here. Then you don't believe that all things are possible with God. I tell you, shut your mouth. Open your ears, and people tell you everything you need to hear. Everything. And I can make an assessment from what comes out of your heart through your mouth and your actions. And that's what it means to be a fruit inspector. I'm not judging to condemnation. But I'm judging to see does our lives, and I say our because I'm in this with you, does it measure up to the standard of what the Word of God is talking about? And in my life, when it does not, I repent. I ask the Lord to forgive me and to help me do so, to help me do so. Now, talk about a foundation that's laid in Christ, and it talks about when the storms come. How many of you know that storms will come? And if you're not in one, one is on its way. And here's your, here's your opportunity to prepare. You know how they tell us, you know, when June hit, start preparing for hurricane season? Well, storms in this life are going to happen. You need to make preparations now. How do you make preparations now? Spending time with the Father. So that when that storm do come, that your foundation isn't shaken. You know, when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast in uh, 2005, um, it was myself and a couple other brothers. Rich Curb was one of them. Rich is the, the white guy that plays the guitar up here. Uh, we went over to the Gulf Coast. And we were trying to get into New Orleans, but um, for whatever reasons, we were not allowed to go into New Orleans. And so we were in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And in Pascagoula, Mississippi, we, we saw and we witnessed what it looked like when a flood comes through and it just wiped the houses clean off of the foundation. The houses who had a foundation that was strong, the foundation remains. There were houses that was completely wiped away, right? And the same thing happens with you and I. These things aren't designed to destroy us, but they're designed to strengthen us, to, to mature us in our faith. Amen? The one thing that we all noticed, most of the people own their homes, Right? But none of them had flood insurance. None of them had flood insurance. How many of you have flood insurance? I, I, I don't have physical flood insurance, but I have spiritual flood insurance. And all of us need spiritual flood insurance. You all want me to tell you how to get this spiritual flood insurance? I'm going to tell you anyhow. Here it is, and this is what Jesus said. Obedience, 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 obedience to the Word of God is the only flood insurance that you will need for the storms of this life. Everything else will fail you. The Word of God will never, never, ever fail you. That's why in counseling sessions I don't give my opinion. That's why I don't give you all my opinion here on Sunday morning, because my opinion at some point in time is going to fail you. 
That's why I always give you the Word of God. Every situation that you may face is in the Word of God. And if it's not in the Word of God, he says that if you crowd to me, if you pray and ask me for wisdom, he says, I will give it to you. I will give you wisdom. It starts with that foundation being laid in Christ Jesus. Marriages, same thing. When you start your marriage, you need to make sure that that foundation of Jesus Christ and love is the foundation. Because if you build that home on anything else, it is going to be destroyed. I know this isn't fun, but I'm trying to help some of you to realize and to understand that it's all about Jesus and being obedient and doing those things that he has commanded us to do. As Pastor PJP always says, we need to be about it. Isn't that the truth? We need to be about it. Listen, the world doesn't care what you have to say. They're watching how you live. They're watching how you and I live. Your children, your coworkers, they are watching how you and I live. And I can tell you, if we are honest, especially as it comes to our family, if you sit down and you interview your kids, me and Pastor Jim talked about this. We've done it on several occasions. You're going to get some truth. You're going to get some truth. They're going to let you know if you're living out your faith or if you're a hypocrite. Your family going to be the first to know. See, you could come here and you can fool us. And then you walk out the door before you get to the parking lot, you're fussing and fighting. It's life. I've done it. But over the years, as the Lord continued to grow me in my faith, and I become more consistent in my faith and being obedient to the things that the Lord has instructed me to do, when I do fall short, it's not the norm. And then my kids and those who are closest to me know that it's not the norm. What do you do? You repent. Father, forgive me. And you know what? In the case when I did this with my wife and kids, listen, not only did I have to repent, but I had to ask them for their forgiveness. And then I had to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to be better in this area through the power of your spirit. Listen, if you're trying to do this without the spirit of God, I can tell you what, pack up your stuff and go home because it's not going to work. You have to be filled with the Spirit of God. That's the only way we can love unconditionally. That's the only way that we can lay that foundation of love in Jesus Christ. You have to be a Spirit-filled believer. That's how come you're able to love your enemies. That's how come you're able not to judge and to condemnation. That's how come you're able to lay a foundation built in Christ. That's how come you're able to bear good fruit. That's how come out of the abundance of your heart if your mouth speaks. Listen, your heart lets me know everything that your mouth says. Everything. And listen, with your words, there's no do-overs. You can't take it back. You cannot snap it out of the atmosphere. Your words are powerful. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And I choose to speak life to every situation that I'm in. Life. God, this is what your word says. Your great name, your great word, this is what it says. Father, your name is on the line. You know, because, you know, when I... You know, I, I don't have any hair right now. I'm sure most of you noticed that. But I still do have a barber. And even when I had hair and I was going to a barber, they would, you know, they would hand you a mirror, right? And I'm like, I don't need that. You know why? Because if it's a good haircut, people are going to ask, say, man, you got a good haircut. Who's your barber? Oh, so-and-so. And if it's a bad haircut, people are going to ask, man, your hair jacked up. Who's your barber? And I'm going to say, so-and-so. And I've learned that from my wife, to take the Lord's word at face value, my mother as well. God, your name is on the line. And I just stand back and watch. Stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand back and watch the power of the most awesome God ever, the creator of heaven and earth, the good, good father. That's who you are. We are loved by you. Loved by you. And so, Pastor Corey, if you all would come on up at this time. And we're going to prepare our hearts for a communion. What a perfect day, Father's Day, to celebrate communion, to celebrate our good, good Father. 
you know, I, and, and I, I share this with you multiple times, but in 2015, 2015 was probably the worst year of my life. There was just so much going on and, and so many different things. And Rich Curry came up to me. He's like, brother, I got a song that I need you to hear. And it was Good, Good Father. And that song kind of became my anthem. It got me through the difficult times. Because what it did is it took my focus off of the negative things that was going on in my life, and I focused on the goodness of God. And see, when you focus on the goodness of God, man, it just does something in your spirit, man. You know, it's just encouraging. You know what? And although I was still in a, still in a wine press, Man, it was just a little bit easier knowing that God is still good and he's still in the blessing business. Some of us have been waiting on answers to prayer regarding so many different things. Let me encourage you. God hears your cry. He hears it. Psalms 103 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so our Heavenly Father has passion on those who fear him. God is good, and he loves you, and he cares for you. He instructs us, cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. The trouble or the tribulation that you're going through is only for a moment. God is good, y'all. Over in Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to read, go ahead and start handing out the elements. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 30. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, he says. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. And so while the ushers are handing out the elements, we're going to have part of, part of the song. We're going to partake of communion. And then we're going to finish up with the song. And then we're going to be dismissed.